Eh, bienvenidos a todos. Bienvenidos. Él es. Hacemos su participación a este webinar. Thank you for your participation in of this in this webinar, exchange of results and solutions at the regional level. This webinar will be chaired by Alicia Zucchetti of LACNIC and Laura Kaplan, manager of cooperation and development of LACNIC. Before giving them the floor, let me tell you briefly how we're going to operate. We're going to be here for about an hour. Please consider that we're going to have simultaneous translation into three languages. You'll be able to access the language of your preference uh, in uh, the lower toolbar, and uh, you'll be able to ask questions in the Q&A panel. And finally, let me tell you that uh, this webinar will be recorded, and in the near future, we'll share the recording and the video so that you can share it with other colleagues. So that's um, all I had to tell you. Thank you for your attention. And now, Laura, please. Thank you, Sandra. And welcome, everybody. I'm Laura Kaplan. I'm the manager of uh, development and cooperation of LACNIC. And uh, this webinar was uh, designed to socialize and uh, to discuss the results of uh, some of the projects that we support through our FRIDA program. Frida. Frida is a fund. It will turn 20 years old. It's a LACNIC fund that provides support as uh, grants and uh, prizes to uh, uh, in the region of Latin America and the Caribbean uh, to develop uh, uh, projects that may have a significant environmental, social, economic impact through the use uh, of uh, technologies through the internet. And in this case, what we are proposing is that the leaders of those projects that have already done their work and that have uh, moved forward and uh, with all the results that they had thought of may tell us of their experience so that others may also enrich themselves and to benefit of those results and uh, adopt uh, some of those conclusions for their everyday work and so that they can know you, meet you and uh, open uh, an interesting discussion about those topics. So I formally welcome you. And now I'll uh, give the floor to Alessia who will introduce the speakers. Thank you all for your participation. Thank you, Laura. And thank you, Sandra. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for being with us today. As you said earlier, we're going to have this webinar in a panel in a panel format. First, uh, the information and appropriation of the digital rights to guarantee uh, the access to information in indigenous languages. This project was developed and it's ongoing by Surco Servicios Universitarios. Uh, and knowledge networks of NARPACA in Mexico. They received a grant of the FRIDA program in 2021 under the category open and free access. And under this project, we have Hilaro Suarez Vega and Melquia Desa, Chao Cruz, whom I now introduce. Hilario is responsible for institutional interrelations and communicator, and he produces a radio program, and he has designed contents on human rights in digital context, especially focusing rural and indigenous areas. On the other hand, we have Melquiades, Quiado Cruz, who's a psychotic uh, uh, investigator and activist. He is co-founder of Surcos Universitarios in Oaxaca, where he currently collaborates, and he was also the coordinator of the project that we will discuss today. He's an active member of a number of uh, collectives of groups and uh, community uh, initiatives. We also have uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, group uh, working in the promotion of uh, the use of internet through solar power. This project received the support of Tomas Alva Edison Foundation of Argentina, and it's 
currently ongoing. It was presented and selected under the modality grants in 2022. In this case, with us, we have Graciela Bertancourt and uh, Facundo Eras. Graciela Bertancourt is a technical assistant. She has a master's degree in education and she's president of the Tomas Alva Edison Foundation and she's the founder of the first robotic school, robot school in Argentina. She's particularly interested in issues related to um, addressing the digital divide. She founded uh, the education network and uh, in Mendoza and she was in Mendoza Futura program to awaken uh, vocations in uh, adolescents from 12 to 17 years in among in with together with the government of Mendoza. Facundo Eras has a, is a sociologist. He is a specialist in social management and has training on sustainable SDGs and strategies for organizations. His expertise is in strategic planning, monitoring, transparency, and uh, citizens engagement. And in these areas, he has provided advice and collaborated with a number of programs implemented by civil society and funded by a number of agencies. He is also the executive director of Nuestra Mendoza, an organization working for the promotion for to promote citizens engagements and transparency in government. Finally, he's a, of the free chair of a social accountability and a member of the sustainability team of um, the National University of Cuyo. So welcome everybody. Thank you for having accepted to participate today. As Laura said initially, we our idea is not just to disseminate the initial results or the results obtained by the projects funded under FRIDA, but also to socialize that knowledge and approach some of the key messages obtained during the execution. Just uh, as a start, and before we uh, specifically discuss the projects, I'd like to uh, each of you from your respective roles and based on your vast experience in your community and country to briefly tell us, uh, introduce your organizations, Surco and the Thomas Alva Edison Foundation. Tell us about the work that you do at a general level, what is your mission and some of the projects that you're implementing. So to start, I'll give the floor is uh, I give the floor to Chiado or Hildardo and then Graciela or Facundo of the Tomas Alva Edison Foundation. So Hildardo or Chiado, Hola. you have the floor. Hello. Let me explain what Surco is. Surco is an organization that comes from an activist worker in Oaxaca and it was founded in 2011, formally. We've always worked in groups before being Surco, popular education, social movements, essentially with essential indigenous groups to defend their territory. Surco arises to defend a topic that we have worked on since 2011, that is community education in Oaxaca, because we had a, a specific base in the indigenous communities of Oaxaca. And on the other hand, we have links with many universities in Mexico, the United States and Germany. And that was the source that drove us to form a civil organization in Mexico for these internships and academic programs with universities. We work with three different topics, technology of indigenous peoples. In this case, um, uh, access to uh, information. The other is uh, linguistic justice that is also in uh, under the uh, technology used by the indigenous peoples. And the other big strategy is everything that has to do with climate crisis 
That's another project that we have uh, developed uh, with Hildardo and other colleagues in Surco. The other project that we are implementing is a strategy of agroecology, a uh, relation between producers and uh, consumers in Oaxaca, where every Friday we give uh, products, the produce to consumers in Oaxaca. This is a project that we are promoting, but in Oaxaca, they know us from the academic point of view, because we have published uh, research and we are we discuss uh, concepts, ideas and practices to challenge not just our own tactics, but what happens in the public policy. So I could maybe um, Hildardo will uh, like to expand on that. Well, uh, from Surco, we have worked uh, with the tools of uh, open source uh, with the communities and with the different organizations in Oaxaca, with the workshops that are organized not, uh, not uh, by Surco, but uh, the networks and uh, uh, trying to disseminate open source and those alternative tools with the other ideas. Um, that is the NGOs, the groups that try to improve the way they live through the tools uh, available. And, in, and um, in our educational projects, we try to implement those tools. I think, and we, that is what we do here in Oaxaca. Thank you, Hildardo and Melquiades. Now, Graciela Ofacundo. Hello, good afternoon. Well, thank you for the invitation. It's a, it's a very pleasant uh, thing to be able to share with you our experiences. The Thomas Alva Edison Foundation was founded in 2004 to, for, to, for education and reducing the, the technological divide. Um, at present, we uh, conduct a good work in education in Mendoza. We were chosen by Microsoft as one of the 17 most uh, innovative uh, foundations for education. We work uh, with the for the SDGs and uh, the target, the goal that we consider most important is uh, quality education, but 17 too, the collaborative work. And we have a number of joint actions. One is with the Foundation Nuestra Mendoza. That enables us to push forward, to implement the project that we presented to Frida. Especially our concern is reducing the digital divide and using technologies to improve the educational processes and learning of all the community, uh, both uh, close and far, because we also have pro uh, projects in Central America. We had some collaboration processes in the European Union, uh, research, and they have to do with it, educational innovation and these scenarios that are new. With me is Facundo, who could uh, add something else. Facundo has a different view. So uh, he, he can give you an, a more social uh, reading. We are focused on reducing gaps. And in this case, the digital divide is one of the largest that we are going through uh, post pandemic. So that's what we are focused on. Facundo, would you like to add anything? No, I just wanted to emphasize what Graciela just said, I'm part of another organization, Fundación Nuestra Mendoza. The work here, we worked uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, Tomás Alba Edison Foundation and uh, our foundation, Nuestra Mendoza. And uh, we have worked jointly precisely because we thought that there we could have synergism by bringing the experience in citizens engagement, uh, spaces for dialogue, and uh, uh, working uh, uh, collectively and um, uh, working with uh, the Al Tomas Alva Edison Foundation and uh, our network, Fundación Nuestra Mendoza. So we decided to start working together and uh, to implement this project. And there's been 
a great synergy between the other two foundations uh, thinking of uh, IT tech solutions. So thank you very much to the two of you. These have been submitted through different thematic axes and different topics, both projects, both the one from the foundation and the one from Surco, tackle problems and challenges that are similar in different contexts. And in this case, what Facundo was saying, this is an advance regarding the next question. This has to do with what led you, in fact, to design that project. What were the challenges? What were the needs that you perceived in your communities? And that then led you to formulate this and to submit this to Frida's program. I will give the floor first to Tiago and Gil from Surco, and then we'll go over to Graciela and Facundo. Over to you. So this is a long story for us. And when we started working at Surco, we always had, were involved with technology, and many of us are in the community of free of open software. We have been part of that community for quite some time now. So this led us to other topics and also to uh, work on linguistic justice. And this has to do with the reality we work with at Oaxaca. There are many speakers of other languages other than Spanish. We speak 16 different languages in Oaxaca, and this makes us totally diverse. In Mexico, we have 68 different languages. So this leads us to think that the ecosystem we live in is leads to homogenizing the culture. So conceiving projects such as linguistic justice leads us to open up and recognize this diversity. In 2011, we started to speak about the possibility of a project called Nacional Nativo. So I was part of that project, Mozilla Nativo. We started to identify several languages, not only at Oaxaca, but also in Latin America and in the Firefox browser. Then we continued with several projects, uh, Digital Security Lab, and in 2017, a problem we had to deal with at Surco. This has to do with research on mining in Oaxaca, projects and concessions in Oaxaca. So my colleague was very active, obtaining public information and things we worked on. But along that process, we realized that the indigenous peoples do not use these platforms or those recognized by the Mexican, by Mexico, because the organizations don't speak the indigenous languages, they speak Spanish and the indigenous languages do not relate to those state agencies much in the same way as there's no horizontal dialogue. So this led us to consider programs and public policies together with the Public Institute on Access to Information and Personal Data Protection. This is a very long name. And then uh, we went together with programs involving the mining concession. So in 2012 through 2021, we managed to formulate the project which has to do with digital rights and access to the to information for indigenous languages. So this path that we have followed mainly, because otherwise, if we hadn't followed that path, we wouldn't have managed to reach this stage, this point. Because I think that it is good to recognize that since 2007, 2017, he corrects himself, when I more actively joined Surco, we tried to really work on this with Frida because this is more aligned with our objectives. But we hadn't won the projects because in one sense, we're applying this to very different projects. So I think that when articulating this narrative of digital rights, access to information, and the issue of inclusion has allowed us then to access funding. And then secondly, to open up possibilities to speak with other organizations in Latin America that work 
with technology and indigenous peoples. Yes, what Yago was saying and what Kala was saying is that to make the different visibilities, the, the different realities visible where these communities are where, that speak the different languages, there are 16 in Oaxaca. So you have the legislation as to how to access information and the government platform, but if the internet infrastructure isn't accessible and it is weak, and even if there is not sufficient knowledge to manage such platforms, somehow these rights and laws cannot be landed. The Mexican government has already signed this, and there are agencies and budgets that seek to facilitate and instrumentalize these laws. But there are other realities regarding infrastructure. So things are not taken into account seriously in the sense of really having a more real planning and infrastructure and follow up, namely to ensure that all these realities are about 11,000 communities. So 10,000 are in rural areas. So these are very similar contexts, weak internet, insufficient connection. So somehow digital rights are not fully applied and the right to access information as well as all those organizations that seek to guarantee this. So in that sense, we have been working on this subject. We need to provide training to those who are interested in this in the communities, very often, these are people who speak the language, but studied a profession. So sometimes they are between the city and the communities, they serve as liaisons. So we have sought to achieve partnerships and alliances with the communities. We landed this project and that is how we worked. So that's all on my side. Thank you, Kiado and Hilaro. Graciela and Facundo, could you tell us about the specific case of your project? Well, the project that we that we worked on had its beginnings in the framework of the COVID-19 pandemic. We had been working already in some spaces that involved education in the province at the beginning of 2020, there was, a, things came to a standstill in education, not only in the country, but you're all witnesses of what happened. In Argentina, this was quite extended to one of the longest um, quarantines. People had to stay at home. Only very few provinces started to gradually enable the education system. So all this led to highlight even more the inequality in education that existed at that time. Those players who had more possibilities could somehow continue and reformulate their link to the education system and could remain connected to school and could follow the plans. Now, based on the conversations we had with other players, we were able to identify the great problems in those sectors that did not have access to the internet. And the main problem at that time was the access to devices that enabled access to the internet. So as from that moment, and as probably occurred in many of the cities of the world, different campaigns were organized to obtain mobile phones, computers, notebooks, in order to refurbish them and make these available to more vulnerable sectors so that they could access the internet. Now, however, progress could be made, but we came across a very important problem, namely the limited coverage of the internet in many regions in the province of Mendoza. 
So after that, and using a tool that Tiago and Hildardo mentioned, we started working on requests for access to public information and started making queries regarding what was the internet coverage available in the province. So as from that point, it was quite difficult for us. We found it difficult to access that information and we managed to build a map stating where access to the internet was available and which are the areas without coverage. So based on that, we started to define what strategies could be implemented. We started to establish connections with some of the players in those communities. And at the same time, we identified some points that were, there were lackings. And we also identified many issues that had affected the economic development of these communities, which were often based on livestock production. So we identified two or three areas that had very important problems. These zones, these areas, had specific problems related to a very low demographic density. In other words, large territories with very few inhabitants. So this was a scenario that was not at all attractive for the private sector who could provide the infrastructure in those areas. So we then started to consider which could be the different proposals Many of these areas had an initial, initial dif additional difficulty that had to do with access to power. Solar power then came up as a relevant, as an important option. And as from that moment, we started working on this project in order to find partners in order to implement this and provide the right to connectivity to some communities which we thought would come hand in hand with the access to other rights. So this is how the project came up. Maybe Graciela would like to add something. Well, the reality is that this project has a strong impact in terms of collaborative work between private companies, civil society organizations, and the government as well. Because when visiting the territory, we had to meet with the governments to see if they would be willing to support us as well as the community communities so that they could have connectivity and access not only to education but also to health care and we thought that they should all have equal opportunities so i'd like to highlight the opening of the governments in order to support this project yes of course and also based on that, comments were made to the following quote, but could you please tell us which were the main activities? Maybe you could summarize this. The main activities in the context of the project or the foundation that is still in progress. So what were the implications for this initiative? So maybe I can start Graciela. Initially, the actions that were taken had to do with this. Once the mapping had been identified with the zones that were more likely to be subject to projects such as this, we then started to establish contacts with those strategic organizations from the public sector, from the private sector, as well as other social organizations, all this to identify which were the real needs identified as well as the expectations of that community at the time. And also to see the support and partnerships that could be established right from the outset. We were aware that implementing a project of this kind would involve the need of having to work with other stakeholders, of being able to generate and find resources to be provided by other channels. In Argentina, 
we are in the midst of an inflation that is very high. Historically, we have had inflation, but over the past years, this has become very high, and this would be playing against the fact that we're striving to achieve projects that we had committed ourselves to achieve. So we also sought ways of establishing partnerships and other stakeholders who would have this commitment. So we signed some agreements with the private sector and some agreements with some municipalities and and uh, based on that, we uh, could identify more clearly where we would have the intervention. The first action that was implemented, having uh, individualized uh, those sectors, uh, was uh, to formalize those agreements, signing uh, an agreement where we would intervene. It's a territory of the Huarpe community. Those, that's an originary people of Mendoza, and they are settled in the in a desert of La Valle. It's a desert that uh, it's a space where these communities of the indigenous people um, uh, have settled and they own their land. So for any actions, they, we needed the approval and the support of these communities. So we organized some meetings between the authorities of uh, the municipality in Huarpe and the foundation, Thomas Alba Edison and Nuestra Mendoza, and the company that provided internet service that uh, they had a majority share by, of the municipality of Ciudad de la Valle. And we all sat at a table to think uh, what each could contribute with that was signed in an agreement. And we signed uh, uh, that that was a very useful tool because it enabled us to distribute responsibilities throughout the project. It was an area that was difficult to reach. So very often we wouldn't be able to visit the territory as we would have liked to be able to monitor the project more closely. but. As we divided the different tasks, the municipality committed to do some infrastructure work that was necessary. The water community decided to work with the community inside, and we committed ourselves to buy much of the supplies that were necessary and to coordinate all the project. And we started to implement the project. So we planned one thing, but as we moved, we started seeing many more things. Certainly that happens in many projects. It's very nice to plan it at a desk with, with Toxa, but when we leave the territory and we start to implement the project, we start seeing many challenges and especially new opportunities. So there we started to see these opportunities that had to do with uh, create capacity building in the use of the internet. So it's not enough to work in the access to the internet, but how important you, it could be to work in the good use of the internet. And there we started to generate a new line of work that had to do with uh, this training, with exchange, uh, many of these young people of the Warpe community attend uh, a regular school where the children remain um, as um, uh, in uh, in uh, the com in the schools, and then they go back to their community. So we organized uh, meetings with these uh, uh, students, Warpe, and the children of a school as Fundacion Thomas Edison, uh, working with robotics and new technologies. And we started to think what would happen if we organized uh, uh, meetings among them and uh, so as to strengthen capacities in the use of new technologies so that these young uh, youngsters that went afterwards when they went back to the community could teach it to the rest of the people who lived with them. I don't want to use more time. I know that there are other people that are going to speak, but I get excited when I talk. So my apologies, you can interrupt me if you wish. Just one more thing, Facundo, that I'd like to clarify, because we speak as if the rest of the people understood. 
what we did. What we did was to put an antenna in the middle of the desert with so solar energy and, and internet connectivity. So a community of originary indigenous people have access to the internet, even if they don't have power. So they can do it through solar uh, power. So there, it's a tower with connectivity in the middle of the desert that provides services to uh, um, uh, original people community. Thank you, Graciela, for that clarification. That's where very important. So based on that, precisely as Facundo pointed out, we continue to implement a number of activities, or they uh, are doing many things in training and education. Now, Kiado and Hill have the floor. If you can tell us about this, um, we'd like to hear about uh, the key activities that you have conducted in uh, with this project. Thank you. Uh, let me start with what Facundo said. When we were in the territory, we realized that the name of the project, as we had thought, was too long for people to learn. So we had to reduce it to a name that was called InDigital. Now the project is called InDigital. So methodologically, we are it's we are working more as InDigital than as we presented it in Frida in 2021. What is in digital? It's the um, a project in uh, working with indigenous people implied three components. One, what everything that we discussed in this historical process of ownership of technology and access to information to generate a repository documentation of everything that we found as we uh, worked all these years. That was the first part, research. Then the part that involved two phases of training. One was by experts of universities as UNAM on rights to access information, personal data, and uh, data governance on, I'm leaving something out, and digital rights. So we needed to look for experts and uh, to learn about uh, the, that knowledge that others have and how can we implement them. This training had to do with uh, uh, the, the, the experts taught the trainers. So it's Surco's team and a team that speaks the languages of the regions where we implemented the project. And there are four communities that speak four different languages. San Andre Chikawaska, they speak Triki or Nahne, better known as Nahne in the original language, Mazateco. Also, we were there in the Sierra Mazateca in San, Lu San Lucas. Gil might help me. And so we were in Coyultepec with the uh, uh, speakers and in the community where I work is Santa Cruz de Avila that speaks Zapcoteco. So this was a process of a training by experts. And then the trainers take uh, all this information to the communities to implement the project. The second component or the third component is the microsite. I just shared in the chat it's the creation or the implementation of a microsite. Why a microsite, you may wonder. The problem that we had with the strategy of transparency and request of data in Mexico is that they are highly specialized for journalists and people of the academia, but not for indigenous populations or vulnerable communities. What do I mean? That there's the format, the way you access uh, somebody who already uses a computer or a, a digital device uh, can use. And what we did was to take this uh, from the four, four with the Zapoteco, Miguel, Mazateco, and Triqui, with these four languages and uh, in Spanish to have access. So from there, we could explain these three themes, digital rights, access to information, 
And an important thing that I didn't mention was community data, because we realized working with a community that many institutions and companies are drawing data from the community, but the authorities don't know what they do with the data. So what we have monitored is the uh, data governance. So that would be the third axis, that is the microsite together with uh, everything involved from research, training, and the technological component. And Hildardo will talk about uh, the campaign in the media that was another component of the project. And another thing that happened is that Oaxaca is a, a, a state that is not so small, but um, the roads, most of them are terraces, and the communities are far from each other because they are, it's very hilly and there are many mountains. So it seems as if the communities were close to each other, but you have to go up and down and go round and round in the terraces. So as a consequence, and then we realized that it was something that the proposal of intervention was very broad because they were four different cultures. And that meant that we had to work it from distant places, four communities in distant places. And what happened was that we had to coordinate with the interpreters, the translators that work in Oaxaca, but those are the liaisons with the communities we went to. So we had to coordinate times with them. And all that was because the um, it was difficult to land the uh, data, rather abstract, to a simpler language, but then translating that into the languages is another process that is difficult. It, it posed other challenges. So it should, that needs to be considered. Now, most of the people we work with are linguists. So they work with translation, but they need to train with Surco. So they underwent a training process of the experts with community data, protection of data, uh, personal data, and uh, digital rights. So we trained them on that. So it took us some time because we said, okay, now let's see what the digital rights are. So, and uh, only after they had understood it, did we implement it in our own language. And I'm saying this because that it was like a drafting a script uh, for the radio programs. We had to undergo that or that uh, process. And so we are going, we are going to, in our campaign, we're going to synthesize, to summarize. We have four themes as, uh, um, and uh, from those, we are going to grasp a concept and then work on it. So it finally, they would be 20 capsules, four of each language plus Spanish, but the process of translation, and uh, training and development of the capsules also had an interesting process because we went to the communities, we worked with the participants, and then we had to, to decide who to record things with. We decided to do it like this because it was for the ownership. We could have recorded it from Oaxaca and we wouldn't have been so worried when going to the communities and the time that we had to devote. But we, what we wanted to do is that if we did things together with them, they'll feel more that they own. It's like when you receive spots from abroad or when uh, uh, you do it locally and people share it locally. That is why we decided to work like that. So, that meant that we had to use more time and uh, to invest more time translating it together with the trainers that spoke the language of the community. So the script was collective. And at the end of the campaign, 
we've called them tamales digitales. I don't know whether the, you have heard about the tamales of Oaxaca. The capsules are the same. S small doses of uh, data, of information. So the idea is uh, to uh, use the community language. So now with that we are in Spotify and on the website. And these are, in the end, for dissemination, we defined a month. We started uh, uh, putting in contact. We have a radio program that uh, Kiago, Kiago, Kiago was telling us in Surco. This is a weekly program, and now it lasts 30 minutes. Pero tenemos una... So in the, we have a radio network of the Autonomous University of Oaxaca every Tuesday at 5 p.m. And then there are five or six community radios that retransmit this. So we have a small network. Now for the purpose of the campaign, we reminded this again and we contacted yet further radios, even one radio from Guerrero who was interested in this. Now the idea and what we're saying, if we look at the script in Spanish, this only allowed us to prepare a first part telling you, telling about what we did and what we worked, how you reach out to a community, how do you present what you say, how the community gets organized. And then in that part of the story, we started adding the issues such as access to information, who generates this. So very basic concepts, but ultimately this was like the attraction and we could set up all the topics and this is now available with that name. So in the end, as I was saying, this was a collective work, the script, and then we had the people who were the liaisons who did the translation and they helped us quite a lot because their family members already trust them. So this allowed us to record this with uh, like a community touch. Well, precisely on that topic and also on something that several of you mentioned, we have about seven minutes left before having a very brief uh, Q&A. Now, both of you referred to the relevance of communities, and of course, the projects are focused on communities and on very specific beneficiaries. And also, Facundo referred to the partnerships that were generated initially, for example, in the case of the Foundation Thomas Alva Edison, and also in the case of Surco, where direct work was done with the involved communities for the purpose of translation and interpretation, as well as preparing the micro capsules. And we think that was particularly interesting because it is something common to the two projects. Could you very briefly tell us in less than two minutes about this experience and how you managed to involve the community and the beneficiaries. In our case, many of us who work at Surco come from indigenous communities. I'm uh, from Zapoteco, and I come from a community, and I'm in close contact with them. And the same happens with Gil. And he produces the capsules for his community. And this partnership, the, the important partnership was with the Juan de Cordoba Research Library, who collaborated with us. They are already experts in translating historic documents. They have also participated in oral lawsuits 
defending some cases of the indigenous peoples. So they already had the, the expertise in the sense that you have to translate things and they already know how to land the topics in their communities. And for us, that was a major progress in the sense of already having trained translators who came from other processes and who also belong to the communities. Gabriela is from the uh, one of the communities and Rossi is from another community and Fry from yet another, Juan from Chica Wasla. So because we knew one another already, this made things easier. Of course, it was quite difficult when we had to learn topics that are somehow technical in nature. This was very important for us because have having people who are really related to the communities was instrumental and also people who recognize our work as surco in the case of masateca we have been working with the community radio we have been working very closely with them so they are well aware of the work that surco carries out in the case of chikawasla all who belong to the tricky collective uh, we have been working with them on topics regarding software location and on translation. And same thing with Guanavilla, forums on defense of the territory in other years. And other with Chihualdepec, we have established relations that were prior to this project. That is why I think this allows us to speak about this real impact on the community because there is a relationship with the community and with the people. This is very important for us. And on the other hand, having that baseline or that community relationship somehow allowed us to establish links to these institutions. Sometimes the institutions would seek us saying, well, we need assistance in implementing this or the other project. In the case of the technical committee of the open government, our access to the information from different communities. And on one hand, this is good, but this somehow takes time away from us to deal with other activities that we need for our own work. But nevertheless, this is very important for us in the partnership. And the thing is that the seed has been planted in these communities after the training activities, after the formal training activities that we offered in Yadavil and Chicaguasto, the answers for yet further training because there is interest and there is a lot of interest in these topics, in these technological issues in indigenous languages. We'd like to add something, Gil. Facundo, Graciela, very briefly, so we can go over to the last question and then we can answer some of the questions that we received. Facu, you go ahead. Yes, as we were saying, and, and regarding the previous question, right from the outset, we sought to establish connections with the local stakeholders, with the communities, and this was the main axis of the project, namely to respond to the needs that they identified that they had and tried to together build solutions to those problems. And all these instances we're working on regarding training and exchange between students, in all these cases, the focus is on that. And planning all these activities is done with benchmarks from the Warpe community. Warpes are an indigenous people from this area. And we work together with planning these meetings, working on the outputs we wish to achieve on the modalities of the different activities on the contents on the capacity building that uh, sort. I think we have, if I'm not mistaken, already organized four to five meetings where we exchange information. People from the community have had exchanges with students and also the facilitators from the different schools seek to build the social ties that generate the necessary trust in order to work on other types of contents. Some initial steps have been taken in the context of Tiago Agildardo referred to 
for example, digital rights, access to public information, and other modernization processes, respecting the lifestyle of these people, and somehow making the technologies available to the reality of these communities. This is work that could not have been done only on one side of the reality. And we think it is essential to have this ongoing dialogue between the community where we are working on and the stakeholders involved in order to really identify the objectives and the best way to implement the project that has been that is being considered. Thank you very much. And now to finish, and before going over to the questions we received, I'd like you to, in one minute, each group briefly summarize the three main results that you think were generated by your respective projects. I can mention two. One is the campaign through the media, not only here, but also through the social media. I think this is an important output for this project. Then the microsite, which is a tool that has allowed us to establish links and to follow up the issues. And thirdly, the communication strategy, he corrects himself, the tra training strategy, because we have to develop a technology to really land all these topics. Excellent, thank you. Yeah. Facundo, well, on our side, I would like to highlight three. One, the implementation of an innovative proposal of access to the internet, this antenna that was set up with solar power. This is the first antenna ever installed in the middle of the desert of the province. So this is a good success story that could be replicated and also installed in other communities a second output is access to the internet as such achieved in a given community. And thirdly, the innovation and the dynamics in this training and exchange between adolescents from schools specialized on robotics and also with other schools, local schools, where the exchange defines these things for the adoption of new technologies while also disseminating the traditions of these communities and has made all these things now visible. Thank you very much. And I'd like to add something that you, the, both, the two of you mentioned during the webinar, namely, this is an output of the two projects, namely to make the realities of the different communities visible, providing them with the tools to access to rights. Now, with this, we can close this seminar. I'd like to thank all of you. And we will now go over to answering the question we received from Javier Revelo. This is what strategic actions are being taken for the sustainability of the projects? We have very little time left, so I'd like to give the floor to Kiago or to Gil. Could you make your comments on this? Well, one of the important topics has always been the funding strategy for these projects. In our case, this does not have qualitative or quantitative projects. These are mostly qualitative projects. So what we are doing mostly to achieve the sustainability of these projects is that the community appropriate these and also to achieve self-funding of the projects because somehow or other, they receive funds from the state in order to expand these projects. That would be one strategy. The second is a partnership with universities, particularly with the United States, we are seeking to do shared activities. And one of the topics is to enable investigation and actions 
in community in in da community data governance. A further point is a social service with students from other universities. In fact, right now, last week, we submitted didactic materials on these projects regarding social service. We received colleagues to work in Surco on this topic. And the other point is to respond to calls. This is always like a game, whether we can we win or we don't win. So the idea is to apply to calls. And another strategy is direct applications to specific agencies. So we need a given amount of money or a given amount of resources in order to continue implementing this project. So this would be how we are measuring sustainability of the projects. Now, nevertheless, Surco is including in this, working on the resources to continue with the projects. Thank you, Tiago. Facundo or Graciela, would you like to add on to these comments? Yes, on our side, this also had to do with generating partnerships, as we mentioned, for example, to do the maintenance of the tower of the internet devices and solar power. We have signed agreements with the municipality and also with the company that provides internet services. So they do the long-term maintenance once the project comes to an end. And also regarding training, we have signed agreements and we have been working with the General Department of Schools of the Ministry of Education of the province of Mendoza and also with the education area of the local government who are very much interested in this project. They have supported this and in fact they have provided mobility and resources in order to do students exchange and they have been supporting this intensively. So we think that we have been able to add further players. We also have private players, for example, a company specialized in solar power who have committed themselves to work on free training activities for the entire community and the efficient use of solar power and how to maintain the devices. And finally, we believe that to maintain the sustainability over time, we need to strengthen the social ties. That is why we're working intensively on the link between young people from the two communities in order to establish a human tie that goes beyond the duration of this project. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all the panelists, the four panelists, and also for sharing your experiences with us. We'd also like to thank the participants. If you have any specific questions regarding the projects, so if you'd like to contact us, please feel free to write us to frida at lacnic.net and we will send us our answers. Thank you very much to all of you.